Hello and welcome. Uh, to begin with, let me please remind you to post any questions you may wish for dis discussion later in the session using the Q&A tab below. Thank you. Um, my name is Galen Fountain, and I've been teaching a series of mostly short courses here at Benton since, since the fall of 2012, uh, mostly centered on themes of food policy and federal budget and appropriations process. This may appear to be an odd combination of topics, but prior to coming to Benton, I served and worked for more than 30 years as congressional staff in both the House and Senate, in personal offices, as committee counsel, but mostly as clerk, effectively staff director for the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Agricultural Food Development, Food Drug Administration, and related agencies. From a federal perspective, at least, there's perhaps no other place where the subjects of food and congressional fiscal policy align to such an extent. In addition, since 2015, I provided independent consulting to the World Food Program USA, which is the US-based NGO that supports the mission of the World Food Program. I'd like to use this time to describe some of the impacts the COVID pandemic has had on food systems and food security, both domestically and internationally. You may find the contrast revealing, as well as some of the responses and recommendations put forward. When the seriousness of the pandemic was coming up here to Americans back in the early spring, grocery shelves often resembled those in some of our major cities upon forecasts of a major blizzard when consumers felt compelled to stock up on bread, milk, and other essentials. But this time, things were different. A blizzard may impair choices for a day or two, but the approaching pandemic seemed to turn traditional supply and demand theory on its head, and no one knew for how long. Suddenly, a large number of Americans became acquainted for the very first time with food insecurity. The global impacts were far worse and still unfolding. Back in April, World Food Program Executive Director David Beasley addressed the United Nations Security Council and warned that even before the pandemic, the world was already facing the worst food insecurity since World War II. And now, COVID-19 has set the stage for a hunger pandemic with crises of biblical proportions on the horizon and the possi famines, possibility of famines in up to three dozen countries. In a more recent report, reveals warnings, dire warnings for children. Hunger produces poverty and suffering and desperate people tend to act out of desperation. It's been said that even in the United States, we're only over nine days away from anarchy and the average American has only three days of meals in their home. As a result, these conditions are brought into question the resilience, indeed the actual structure of entire domestic and global food systems and place many millions of people in dire peril. Problems of food supply are often seen as problems of distribution. While Robert Maltus famously predicted more than 200 years ago that the human population and food supply were on a collision course, and while it is true that we will need to continue producing more food on fewer arable acres in order to feed an ever-growing population, the world does currently produce enough food to be food secure. And that is certainly true in the US. COVID-19, however, does present certain challenges. There are many images of food security in America. Some are framed in Rockwellian nostalgia. Others are a reminder that food security can be fragile. U.S. agriculture production capacity remains an envy of the world, capable of feeding not only every American, but also a, portion, a, very, a good portion of the world's population. But lately, the food systems have all, we've all come to rely on have been exposed to serious frailties. The pandemic is responsible for both health-related primary impacts and secondary impacts. These secondary impacts include joblessness, movement restrictions that impede the flow of commerce, and struggles to reopen economies, including special risk presented by eating and drinking establishments. Prior to the introduction of COVID-19, between one-third and one-half of U.S. food consumption was sourced through restaurants and other commercial institutional food outlets. Children, notably, relied on school meals. Suddenly, two major shifts in food marketing occurred. The closure of commercial and institutional eating establishments totally disrupted the normal food supply chains and the so-called just-in-time marketing schedules revealed total incapacity to maintain retail supplies in times of greatly shifting consumer demand. Caught in the middle 
were producers of perishable or time sensitive crops and livestock that have lost markets, processing capacity, or both. While urban consumers stress over the lack of grocery staples with an adequate life shelf life to satisfy the new circumstances, farmers were plowing under crops in the field, destroying food and storage, and euthanizing livestock, in part because meat processing plants themselves had become COVID-19 super spreaders. As with so many other aspects of the pandemic, it was a perfect storm. Food in America is possibly the most important commercial product commonly taken for granted, but it didn't take long to see its critical nature and to discover that the person stocking shelves in the grocery section of Walmart is now a coveted essential worker. America has faced slightly similar problems before. The 1930s were a time of social and economic upheaval that to some degree was centered on the food systems of the day. A combination of market forces, extreme weather, unwise farming practices and others helped push the nation into the Great Depression. And part of the outcome was the new approach of government to support the agriculture sector and provide a safety net of sorts for people facing hunger. A modern version of those programs is now part of the US COVID response, and in some cases, early reminiscent of New Deal programs. Even in 21st century America, hunger remains. It never totally went away. But today, many Americans are waiting in lines at food banks they never thought they or dreamed they might visit. Suddenly, the large number of children who rely almost daily on school meal has become sadly very apparent. And unsurprisingly, anti-hunger NGOs are reporting a significant increase in food security across the country. Feeding America, one of the largest U.S. domestic anti-hunger NGOs, provides data on food insecurity at the state and county level across the country. Their data has tracked the increase in those levels from a 2018 baseline until just this last few months. To provide an insight into the COVID-19 impact on American food security, I'd like to draw a few comparisons that represent U.S. counties with the highest rankings in poverty, wealth, and population density. If you look at, at, this, at this slide, you will see the four counties here that are deemed to be the lowest income counties in the United States based on census data. Wilcox County, Alabama being the, the lowest income county. On the right hand side, you see sets of numbers uh, that represent what the food security levels were in 2018 compared to May of 2020. In the case of Wilcox County, you see it's gone from 27, 24.7 up to 29.8. And you can see similar impacts for the other counties in South Dakota, Kentucky, and Mississippi. Those counties with, with a smaller font actually represent counties in those same states that indeed do have currently the highest levels of food insecurity. You might take note of Jefferson County, Mississippi at 34.2. That also happens to be the largest level of food insecurity in the United States. Conversely, and not surprisingly, the high income counties far, far better. Loudoun County, Virginia, our uh, highest income county in the country, uh, went from 3.8 to 8.6. And I might note that whereas Jefferson, Mississippi was the highest level of food insecurity in the country. Loudoun County 8.6 is the lowest. But you can see also how these numbers are represented in these other counties uh, that had the highest income rankings. Geographically, when you look at the rural counties, it's, it's a bit of a mix, uh, depending probably on other factors besides just the rural nature of the counties. But again, you can see the increases uh, some far more exaggerated than others. And then on the urban settings, uh, again, it's a bit of a mix, uh, going from Los Angeles uh, down to Maricopa County, and you can see there what the numbers have been for these, these individual counties. If you combine them to composites and try to compare this data based upon the types of counties being represented from low income, high income, rural and urban, uh, the pattern does emerge, and again, it's not very surprising. The low-income counties are going to be uh, the highest levels of food insecurity. The high income are going to be the lowest. Rural and urban kind of meet somewhere in between, again, based upon the individual circumstances of those counties. A little closer to home, uh, Albemarle County, 
uh, shows a rise from 9.9 to 15.1. And uh, I'm sorry, I was in Virginia, even closer in Albemarle County. It goes from 8.4 to 13.1. But as you can see, in every instance, there's a marked increase in the levels of food insecurity across America since the introduction of COVID. And if economic conditions persist, uh, we're likely to see continued increases or at least maintenance of high levels of food insecurity. As noted earlier, COVID impacts on global hunger are even quite more severe, and they actually begin for position of hunger already in, on the rise in many parts of the world. When speaking of food insecurity or food security, definitions are important. So let's take just a moment to make sure we're all speaking the same language. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, defines food security with a number of, of, of specific elements. And you can see here what those are. Mentions of uh, all people at all times, uh, different methods of access, uh, highly quality, high quality foods, uh, health requirements, and so forth. The, the um, conditions you see here uh, mirror pretty well what are known as the four pillars of food security. Uh, availability, access, utilization, and stability. And availability simply refers to the fact that food must be present, that it must be produced in sufficient quantities and as proximate to the people that need it. Access is historically the larger challenge for most of the food insecurity in this world. It refers to the ability to afford food and so therefore it's tied to jobs, income. It also it, it relates to barriers that may impede certain populations that for political, ethnic, religious, gender, or other barriers may make access far more difficult. Utilization simply refers to the ability for the food to be, have enough nutrition and for the health conditions of the, of the people to be able to have a healthy lifestyle. This is extremely important when it comes to, I, to problems like child wasting. Uh, stability or resilience um, goes to the statement that it must be uh, present at all times and therefore not interrupted. In addition to, to this definition, there's two others that I think are important. The ways to think of hunger uh, as chronic or acute. Uh, chronic hunger, or sometimes referred to as undernourishment, really speaks of the nutritional conditions of a, of a person or populations over a long period of time. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean lives are at risk, but, but health is impaired. And it simply means that people from day to day uh, just are insecure in what they have for nutrition and that hunger is simply something they've learned to live with. More serious and more immediate, however, are problems of acute hunger or food insecurity. And in these situations, lives really are at risk. And this is where emergency of any programs come into play because again, the, the, the situation here is trying to keep people alive. Acute hunger is often attributed to conditions at or above level three or crisis on a scale known as the Integrated Phase Classification, or IPC. This is a major different levels of food security or insecurity from one, which is minimal or none, to five, which is catastrophic or famine. And, and there are hunger advocates, I might say, who argue that level five is less a measure of food insecurity than an acknowledgement of failure, for in this case, deaths of starvation have already occurred. To better understand how a global pandemic can so dramatically exacerbate global hunger, it's important to examine some of the basic drivers of food security on such a scale. Just a few years ago, global hunger seemed to be on the retreat. The UN Millennium Development Goals set forth in 2000 targeted a 50% reduction in the prevalence of undernutrition from 1990 to 2015. That goal was nearly achieved. The succeeding, I'm sorry, the succeeding set of targets the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals are far more ambitious. They aim to actually eliminate hunger by the year 2030, which is a goal now seems increasingly impossible to achieve. And so why is that? In spite of the Millennium Development Goal success, global hunger has been on the rise. The number of undernourished people rose to 690 million in 2019. That's an increase of 60 million over the last five years and 10 million just since 2018. Since 2015, a number of conditions have led to a dramatic downturn in food security, which include conflict, climate change, and a slowing of the global economy. 
In 2017, WFPUSA investigated the linkage of food insecurity and global instability caused primarily by the steep rise in conflict, usually at the hands of non-state actors within states. From a broad literature review, a clear consensus emerged drawing a correlation between food insecurity and conflict as mutually enforcing conditions. A pre-COVID-19 report, the 2020 Global Report on Food Crisis, was issued early this year by a number of UN and state agencies. And it identifies conflicts as accounting for more than half of the people suffering from acute hunger. Conflict, climate change, and slowing the global economy has set the stage for historic rise in hunger. And to add insult to injury, large areas of East Africa are now suffering from the worst outbreak of desert locusts in 25 years. The introduction of COVID-19 to this mix will serve as an amplifying agent for all these conditions. In 2019, acute food, hun food hunger and food insecurity affected 140 million people across 55 countries. This is a steep this year, but it is estimated by the end of this year, COVID-19 will add another 130 million people for a total of 270 million whose lives, livelihoods, or both will be threatened by hunger. COVID secondary impacts are far reaching and context driven. While the number of people acutely food insecure may double within a matter of months, those numbers may linger for years. Pre-existing vulnerabilities will be exacerbated and the World Bank forecasts the deepest global recession since World War II, pushing up to 100 million additional people into extreme poverty, making food access further out of reach for millions. So there's a number of specific ways in which COVID-19 will increase this threat of food insecurity. One is reduced household purchasing power. Uh, as we mentioned about food access, loss of jobs, loss of income, loss of just purchasing power due to higher prices for food are all going to impact people's ability to have access to food. This will be especially harmful to people in the informal economy, which does make up a large proportion of, of workers especially in developing countries. Another problem is going to be a significant reduction in the remittances that people have been able to send back to their home countries. Uh, most countries only have a 20% uh, reduction anticipated in the remittances they're going to receive, which is further going to reduce purchasing power. Certain countries, especially those relying on extractive industries like oil or tourism industry, uh, they too are going to see problems with their currency devaluation and further driving up prices for food. Food availability supply chains, the same sort of impairments that we've seen in this country just gonna be much worse across the, across the globe, especially for those countries that really do rely on imports. And this is going to impact urban areas where imports have been the mainstay for making their supplies uh, necessary. And as lower incomes and this broken supply chains uh, combined, there's a likely to see a more growing civil unrest, political instability, or worse. Most of the food production in developing countries is labor intensive. Sick people cannot work. In the aftermath of nearly every major disease outbreak, but especially Ebola in 2014, egg production has always fallen in these affected areas. And so conditions are going to be damaged producers or perishable commodities, and also those that rely on, on imports. And, and many producers, because of all these delays and falling income, will not be able to acquire the kind of tools and inputs they need to continue farm production. Seed, fertilizers, other equipment simply may be unavailable to them, and that will impact their future production. Government capacities are going to be very challenged especially those with falling incomes and currency problems, uh, safety nets so that they've always used to help support incomes. The school closures will affect school feeding. The health systems, especially for young children, those are all going to be impaired as these conditions continue. Uh, political stability uh, is going to be facing impacts from rising unemployment, especially for the youth. And this may aggravate existing socioeconomic grievances, lead to inequalities and more social discontent and civil unrest. And for those countries who are not seen as handling the pandemic very well, uh, this may even generate further unrest and grievances within the countries. Conflict is noted earlier 
has always been a major problem. And now as more governments are focused more on, the, on health, the primary aspects of COVID, this is going to allow a lot of armed groups, which you've already seen, to intensify their operations, try to make land grabs, and also be liable for violence to certain other vulnerable populations based on uh, ethnicity, uh, gender, or whether they're in refugee or IDP locations. And sadly, perhaps most sadly of all, is going to be the impact on children. Just a few days ago, Lancet published an item summarizing work by consortium of nutrition, economics, food, and health researchers that provided the following findings. Even short lockdowns and periods of mobility restrictions will reduce the gross national income in, these, in low and middle income countries by 7.9% compared to pre-COVID. This will translate into a 14.3% increase in the prevalence of wasting. Child wasting during 2020 it means an additional 6.7 million children at the age of five. At the same time, it's going to be seeing a 25% reduction in health and nutrition services. They estimate that as a result of all of this, they estimate approximately 10,000 children under the age of five during this year will die each month as a result of these conditions. Most of these occurring in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So there have been responses to all of this, uh, some at least. Americans have seen a federal government response to COVID. Uh, over the past few months, uh, you've probably seen reports of a number of, of bills passed by the Congress to provide literally trillions of dollars in resources to deal with COVID impacts in this country. Most of those are health related or to help, uh, help cushion the economic impacts on families. Some have been directed though towards food systems or, or nutrition uh, in the terms of, of billions, a few billions, which have been divided largely between support for direct support for, for farmers and ranchers and some for nutrition assistance. But in terms of international uh, support, there's been a little, but actually very little. In fact, in terms of direct food assistance, there's been virtually none. So what are the other some of the recommendations that, that have been put forward on how to deal with food insecurity related to COVID? Uh, some of these are, are, are pretty intuitive. One is to support critical assistance. Uh, this is going to be important both in terms of making food available where necessary, but also simply to make sure that the incomes can be provided and so that there's some way that challenges, uh, especially in urban areas can be met. Also, the assistance has to be adapted to meet the special conditions of COVID-19. An example of this could be in the current uh, provision that's now before the Senate, uh, there is some money uh, that was included for vaccine distribution in international settings, in developing countries. And there's actually language in that bill that recommends that the World Food Program uh, be the ones to distribute the vaccines. Now, the WFP is not a vaccine distribution agency, but it does reflect the fact that they do have a very broad network across the country. So they would be able to give vaccines probably more efficient, efficiently than other agencies would. Therefore, this is simply an uh, indication that they have to be flexible and they all have to work together. Disruptions need to be minimized, uh, both to keep the supply chains going and to try and stop things like export restrictions and other actions that can happen that will further impair food security. Uh, social protection systems are vital. Again, this is going to be important to deal with lost remittances, lost incomes, to try and fight back the loss of gender equity gains that we have seen uh, in, some, in some cases in developing countries in just the past three or four years, and also trying to maintain the safety protections for children including uh, making sure that school meals can be provided when possible to help small kids to get the nutrition they need. Ex excluded groups, especially women and girls, have to be protected from both the, the kind of violence that may occur and simply make sure they provide the adequate access they need to food and food resources. Uh, data collection has to be important to make sure that the assistance is getting where it needs to in the right form. 
Minimizing social tensions will also be necessary to try and reduce or avoid uprising conflict. They can simply further complicate all these problems. And also, uh, partnerships need to be developed among all the countries, the international community, the NGOs, to make sure that everybody is working together in the same, same manner to, to make these programs effective. Um, so I just want to make sure that, you know, we do see here that there are major challenges to food security in the world. So far, the primary staple commodities, the cereals, the grains in particular, have been held stable. But remember, a lot of these were based upon harvest of previous years. Some of the better questions may be, what is going to happen in the future? Um, COVID is impairing farming practices now. There would be a question of will there be enough labor? What's going to happen for time sensitive demands? especially for small hold farmers in developing countries who lack mechanized capabilities, this becomes even more complex. Looking ahead, the future of agriculture has many questions. What crops should they plant? Are, is long-term product demand shifting? Will weather conditions even later in 2020 further imperil food production in the short term? Some argue we're dominated by a neoliberal view that consumption-driven global trade allows comparative advantage to provide a wide variety of goods at relatively low cost. Redundancy is removed, but at the same time as evident by COVID-19, globalized systems, food in particular, may prove quite fragile. COVID-19 has revealed weaknesses in just-in-time supply chains when product changes, when demand changes rapidly. In the UK, food came into the country at more or less the same speed as it sold in stores. Our shells in the U.S. have raised questions as well. This suggests an examination of a centralized versus decentralized food system and what other what opportunities might, might prevail for the future. The term resilience has become a catchphrase in recent years to describe conditions necessary to support food security, especially among vulnerable populations. Resilience empowers people to cope with sudden shocks. The sustainability of the effects if it serves only to reestablish or reinforce the status quo of an existing inequity. Resilience should hold not only the capacity to cope, but to adapt, to, tr to transform. Resilience and transformation are not mutually exclusive. They should be a continuum. So as we discuss all this today, Congress, the administration, continue to work for the agreement on response to the COVID-19 pandemic that may or may not include a global response. The world has seen the instability that can occur when hunger is out of control, and the U.S. touched on those dangers during the 1930s. Already, assistance provided to support U.S. systems in both House and Senate proposals, and work is underway to include resources for international food assistance. Notwithstanding political resistance arguing the U.S. must control spending and focus only on Americans. Although present at the time, that was not the vision that prevailed in 1948 when Secretary of State Marshall and plan for stability across Europe. The vision for 2020 remains to be seen. Okay, thank you. And I'd be happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Okay, I have a, a question here that, uh, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, there might be some opportunities here. And, and what, what could those opportunities look like? I realize that might be kind of hard to imagine given all that's going on. But, but I mentioned a little bit about how one thing COVID has done, and, and not, just, not just for the food security issues, it's true across the board in terms of social justice, uh, economic uh, well-being, all, all kinds of, of elements are important to society. But what we have seen with the impacts of COVID domestically and internationally is that the food systems are fragile, which means now we have an opportunity to take a look at these programs and these types of, of systems to see what works, what doesn't, what kind of modifications could, should be used. 
And this may re require, as, as I suggested there just a few minutes ago, it may require a transformation of the food systems themselves. To transform systems, you have to change the goals. Historically, food systems have been driven by three underlying objectives, mostly efficiency, yield, and profit. Now, one might recognize that these goals are shifting already in order to meet climate, diet, sanitation. Recall that COVID-19 is reported to have originated in a food market and demographic changes. But agriculture is a very old and entrenched part of the human experience and well-grounded in the political economies, political economies of many nations, the U.S. being no exception. So transformation is possible, but won't come easy. If it's determined the transformation is necessary uh, at home and abroad and around the world, then there will need to be future research. It's going to be necessary both to determine what a new system would look like, but just as importantly, how it could be integrated into the present systems. Uh, just so you know, the UN has announced plans to convene a summit next year on the role of food systems and how they might need to be changed um, going forward. That may be a start. Uh, next question I see here, um, what role uh, does or can the private sector play in reaching food insecurity, especially during COVID? Of what seems to be a shift to resources towards domestic COVID relief. Well, the private sector uh, plays a, a big role in lots of ways. The most of the food, of course, that moves in international channels moves through the private sector. Uh, there was a time when food imports from the United States were largely food aid related transfers of commodities. Uh, over the past number of decades, commercial trade has dwarfed the amount of the percentage of international traffic and food that's for food, you know, emergency food assistance. So they're already playing a big part. Um, and they're able to make investments in developing countries. Uh, there needs to be attention paid to making sure that they're not being harmful to food systems in those countries and they're doing what they can to actually bolster those systems. Uh, more of a public than a private uh, sector example is that some changes have been made recently in federal food aid programs where pro previously it was mostly all U.S. grown commodities that were being made available to developing countries. Now that's shifting to either a cash-based program or making sure that, for example, in the school feeding programs that the U.S. government does provide that they have the ability to use locally grown products in those schools in order to help build their own systems in these developing countries for long-term sustainability. Okay, uh, another question, uh, how can current students get involved with this issue, make an impact, uh, learn about it, uh, become more acquainted with how these programs work, what the impacts of food systems are, uh, research is going to be important as I just mentioned. I think we're probably now at a uh, maybe a, a bit of a tipping point here where um, um, the uh, interest in a full examination of these systems is going to be uh, made a highlight and so I think we'll have to do a lot of a lot of work there to make sure what a new system should look like and how we can integrate them in, in into the current ones. Um, another question here about uh, providing leadership uh, for uh, policy insights to make systems less fragile. Um, well, leadership is always going to be key. Uh, there, there has to be uh, leadership either in the public sector or the private sector to make sure that the right sort of policies are both developed and implemented. Um, I would think that uh, trying to fully understand how all these food systems are interrelated uh, is going to be the, maybe one of the first steps to make sure of knowing how changes that need to be made can be done so in a way that will not be harmful but it instead uh, provide for um, uh, long-term uh, sustainability in these poor countries. Uh, another question I have here, 
is um, regarding to research in victory gardens. Uh, perhaps the response to being cooped up, that's I suppose very possible. I think we're all suffering from that. Um, you know, there's been also in kind of in, in regard to community gardens, there's also been a resurgence and in an interest in urban, urban agriculture, urban farming. And it, they're all kind of, kind of interrelated. And so I think you're seeing both from a perspective of trying to again, get out of the house without leaving the house. Uh, this is one thing I think has caught a lot of attention, but it also goes to a larger interest in what we've been referring to as local food, so that you're trying to produce locally the food that is consumed locally. But one thing I think that needs to be said as a, as a bit of a, of a caution here is that one of, one of the elements that has made the U.S. agricultural system so productive is its ability to have large-scale farming, which I know a lot of people have issues with. And as we look at some of the climate implications and macro social implications, I, I think there's some real questions that need to be raised. But again, that does provide the volumes of food that are necessary to feed the kind of populations that we're leading to, to avoid what Robert Maltus warned us about 200 years ago. So we have to be careful that we, in, in, in trying to secure more local home-based food systems, we have to make sure that we're gonna be also be able to adequately provide for the kind of supplies that are going to be necessary to protect food security, both here, around the world for the years to come. Okay, are there any other questions or have I think I've uh, covered all? Is there anybody else that has uh, any sort of a question or anything they'd like, like to raise? Well, if not, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for taking the time today to discuss these issues. Uh, I do believe they're extremely important, uh, obviously, because after all, food, the food systems are one of the most important features of human experience, uh, something that people literally cannot live without. And so we have to be very cautious in how we proceed to make sure that food security is something that's not going to be maintained just for the present, but for the future and for everyone. With that, thank you. I hope you have a good day and I hope you all stay safe. Thank you.